So for the Journal Club today, we're going to we're going to delve into a paper from 1890 by Emil von Bering and um, and Kitasato. I always have trouble with his first name. Shibasaburo, Shibasaburo Kitasato from Kyushu in Japan. The title of the paper is concerning the development of diphtheria immunity and tetanus immunity in animals, and it was published in the uh, German Medical Weekly in 1890. And as background in, in, for this paper, you know, there was this rivalry between Pasteur and his, his uh, followers in Paris, and then um, Robert Koch and his followers in, in Berlin. And so Bering and Kitasato were working at, um, at, uh, uh, with Robert, Robert Koch in Berlin. And so, and as background in, in the whole thing, at Pasteur's place uh, in 1888, for the first time, there, there were experiments that were done by Emil Roux, uh, Dr. Roux. And actually there's a Roux, Dr. Roux in Paris, to play on words because it's R-U-E and then Roux is R-O-U-X, Roux to Dr. Roux in Paris. Emil Roux um, and, um, and another uh, investigator found out that the the toxicity of, of the diphtheria bacillus, which had been identified, and the tetanus bacillus rod, which had also been identified, were not caused by the, by the bugs themselves. They were caused by toxins that the, that the bugs released into the, into the milieu, into the bloodstream, and so forth. And on the basis of that, Bering and Kitasato um, were trying to understand how the how you could develop immunity to these um, to these tox toxins that these bacteria were releasing, so they weren't trying to make uh, what they didn't try to to uh, generate immunity to the whole bug simply to the toxins, and they didn't really know what the toxins were comprised of. You have to remember that back at the end of the uh, of the nineteenth century, proteins were not sort of a a thing at that, at that play, point in time. Um, anyway, Rue and, and, and others um, identified the fact that the toxins were the, were the culprits that were causing the disease. And then diphtheria is, is a disease of the upper respiratory system. And basically, the, the, uh, with all kinds of, um, you know, uh, catarrh and, and so forth, the membranes would form that would block the the breathing tubes and, and the trachea and so forth and 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 it was and that was lethal. People died, mostly young kids. Tetanus, on the other hand, was a, was a more of a sporadic disease. The, the, the diphtheria was was a sort of there's all it was endemic and it was a major problem uh, in the pediatric age group. Tetanus was is that's what you get locked jaw from, and it causes a neurological problem and so forth and it's and you also die <laughs> but it but it's not as not as uh, contagious or endemic as uh, as diphtheria was anyway um in the paper that bearing and, and kitasato published in 1890 it, it's in this uh, german medical weekly and you know it had it's it, it hasn't been translated into english the the one that's on my, on my website is a translation that was done by the husband of one of my fellows, uh, and um, who he was bilingual in German and also French, and um, and so he translated it for me. It's only three or four pages, so it's a little bit. It's very much similar to the to the papers that uh, Louis Pasteur would stand up and and hold forth at the, at the French uh, National Academy, uh, and it was really uh, sort of a, a, an abstract version of of really what happened and and so forth. So in the very first part of the paper, they say we have been able to cure as well as prevent disease caused by both diphtheria and tetanus. Now, <laughs> that should be followed by an exclamation point, but it wasn't, you know, because it was a scientific paper. That's a pretty brash statement. And, but then they go on in the rest of the paper uh, and they, they say how they accomplished that, how were they were able to be able to, you know, come up to, with that conclusion. They said that what they've done is, is that they used, uh, they did experiments, a whole series of experiments, both with that diphtheria and also with tetanus. 
um, using the, the cell-free blood, plasma essentially, or also serum. Serum is what's left over after the blood clots. Plasma is what's the, the fluid part of the blood before it clots, or if you use anticoagulants, you prevent clotting to form, but basically they're the same thing. And from the standpoint of immunity, they both contain antibodies, which is what this paper is really the first paper that uh, that describes antibody activity, even before they the antibody as a word was coined, essentially. The conclusions that they started with are, are is that um, is really sort of what we have in our in our papers today is as in the abstract comes up front, tells you tells you basically the bottom line, what you need to know. And if you don't want to read the whole paper, you can sort of get the gist of things. And this is what these people have done here, that they're going to be, that they've been able to cure as well as to prevent these, these really bad diseases. And then they go on to say that the explanation of this immunity that they've been able to create is new. So they're essentially, they're, they're basically planting their lance into the stake into the ground like, you know, and establishing their priority. Uh, and so this is really something that, you know, up until this time, the Koch, the Koch Institute or the Koch group in Berlin was mostly focused on microbiology. This is immunity. And so this is what Pasteur has already tried to establish himself as being Mr. Immunity in the world. And now they've come along and they basically go on to say that the previous explanations for immunity, of which there were two at that stage of the game, one, one was championed by a fellow by the name of um, uh, Mechnikov, Ilyich Mechnikov, who was a Russian biologist. Um, and of course, this was before the revolution that happened, you know, couple of decades later. So he, he was very well educated and he was from the, the aristocracy in, in Russia. And he was, um, a, a very short story about Mechnikov. Mechnikov was down in Naples um, in the wintertime, probably, and <laughs> getting out of cold Russia. And he was doing experiments or looking at the at starfish larvae under the microscope. And he could see that there are these amoeboid cells in there that if you put stuff onto the microscope slide, that they would sort of gobble up the stuff. So he described really phagocytosis is what we call that process by which cells engulf things, invaginate, they take them inside and then they digest them. And that's phagocytosis. And so that was really a new thing that was happened about, about the same time in the late 1880s mid and late 1880s. And that was given as a, as a perhaps a, a, a mechanism of immunity, which was different from what Pasteur had suggested from his experiments. And remember what he suggested was, is that if you had to have a live attenuated organism that would to vaccinate people or animals, and that that would then deplete the host of trace nutrients that were absolutely essential for the hosts, for the, for the ability of the bug <clears throat> to replicate inside the host. And that was sort of a passive kind of a uh, thought pattern in terms of what immunity could be. So, so Bering and Kitasato said, you know, it's, that doesn't explain what's going on in diphtheria and tetanus for sure. And so that's what we're gonna tell you about. Bering then introduces the experiments that they did together, Bering and Kitasato, on tetanus. And he, he puts aside, he said, you know, I've already done very similar experiments with uh, diphtheria, but I couldn't be sure that uh, what I was seeing and what, the way I was interpreting it as, as being actually true and also extrapolatable to other bugs. So Kitasato was in the lab next door, evidently, and he was working on tetanus. And so they applied the same series of experiments that Bering had already done in diphtheria to tetanus. And they say in this paper is, is that now, as a consequence of finding exactly the same phenomena, that now they know that the diphtheria experiments, the interpretation of those was correct. And so what, what they did was they took one rabbit and they immunized them uh, with uh, cultures from um, 
uh, tetanus containing cultures. And they don't go into the re how, they, how they did that, but they said as a consequence, that animal became immune. And as a proof of the immunity, they could, they could take that animal and, and inoculate them with 10 mLs of tetanus cultures subsequently, whereas only a half an mL of the same culture was, was, was lethal for other animals. And that rabbit that they had already immunized lived. And then, they, then they, what they did was they, they, um, they said that the, the, they used toxin separate from the, from the bugs themselves and that the rabbit could withstand up to 20 times the normal lethal dose of toxin. So then they decided to find out what was going on in this rabbit. And so they bled the rabbit from its carotid artery up in the neck. You know, we usually do it in the ears. The, the rabbits are great for these kinds of experiments because they've got ears that have these veins in them. All you have to do is hold the rabbit down and you can put a needle into the vein of the ears. And, and you can see the, all the blood vessels very easily too because the skin and so forth is very... Anyway, they did it out of the carotid artery. Uh, and then they took, took the cell-free plasma from this rabbit and uh, injected two different mice, one with 200 microliters and another one with 500 microliters intraperitoneally. Then they... Um, and they also had two controls that did exactly the same thing. And the, the two controls died within 36 hours and both of the um, experimental mice were fine, no problem. So then they went on and they took six mice and used serum this time, not plasma, from that same rabbit. And they, there were six control mice and they injected 200 microliters of, of the uh, experimental uh, serum and all the controls died and the, and the experimental animals were fine. Then they, they took uh, some cultures whereby they had shown in other experiments that only five microliters, microliters a thousandth of a um, liter, a milli milliliter is, no, that's a millionth of a, a microliter is a millionth of a, of a liter. A milliliter is a thousandth of a, so it took five microliters and that could be lethal for animals within four days. And they, and 100 microliters in, in animals um, was lethal within two days. What they did was they mixed the, uh, this, um, uh, the serum from the, from the rabbits with one ml, one milliliter of, of uh, tetanus culture fluid, incubated it together for 24 hours and, and then inoculated mice and all the mice were okay. And all the controls again died. Then they did similar kinds of experiments with um, taking blood from rabbits that had never been immunized and so forth, and it had no, no protective effect of, of, of all that stuff. And they go on to say then, and this is the end of the experimental aspect of this paper, they go on, on to say that, you know, in, in humans, of course, they haven't tried this yet, they said that blood transfusions have been used in the past successfully, not always but if, if the blood transfusion was, could take, if they took it from uh, people who had uh, survived a particular infection, it, sometimes it would work. Not always, but sometimes it would work. So there was something special about the but, blood. And they, they ended their paper by saying the blood is a very special juice, which was actually a quote from Greek times and so forth, I'm told. So the interesting thing about this paper is, is that it, it's the one that everybody um, quotes as the beginning of humoral immunity, antibodies, and serotherapy that we'll get into as time goes on in the journal club. But there's, but the thing about this paper is it's all about the tetanus experiments that were Kitsisato's, but they used, according to Bering, they used Bering's ideas that he'd worked out in the diphtheria thing. And then a week later, in the very same journal, the German Medical Weekly, Bering then put out his data in diphtheria, but he was a single author on that paper. I haven't read that paper yet, but I'm going to read it now that I've done this journal club. Um, and the thing is, that becomes important later on. And I and, and I think that what um, what I'd like to leave you with is is that this is sort of an introduction into these two individuals and also the the rivalry with the, the Pasteur group and so forth, because there's an awful lot you can read there if you're interested. And now that we have we can Google it.
and you can go online, you can you can lose yourself in, in the history, of the ancient history of these kinds of things. It turns out that, um, so that was an 1890 paper with both of them. And in 1891, Kitasada went back to Japan. Bering then went on and started doing more experiments with um, serotherapy and using inoculating horses and going getting into horse serum and so forth as therape therapeutic um, in, into humans. Well, in 1901, Bering, um, two things happened to Bering. One was is that he won the first Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine. It was given to Bering without Kitasato. And it was given to Bering, if you go, if you go on to the Nobel, NobelPrize.org website, and read, and read what, what's on there, not very much, it's just sort of like the citation, you find that they gave the prize only for the experiments in diphtheria. They don't mention Kitasato, they don't mention tetanus, and so forth. And so one question is, so why was that? What happened to poor Kitasato, you know? And Japan's interesting in this, in this sort of time frame because of the fact that um, it was only open to the West as a result of Admiral Perry sailing into the, to the port of Nagasaki in 1853 and opening up Japan to at least trade with the West. And then it wasn't until 1868 where they, um, they threw out the shoguns and they brought back, they brought the emperor in. So there was the Meiji, Meiji Emperor and the Meiji Restoration in 1868. And then from 1870 on, they really, they did really start, started um, incorporating all of the um, things that, that, were, that were new to them from, from the West. And there was, a, there was sort of like a, a two-way street going between Germany and Japan. And if you go to if you go to J Japan and you go you look at their you go to uh, to the northern island of Hokkaido where the Sapporo beer factories are the, all, the buildings are all old Germanic red brick buildings because and the Japanese figured if they were going to make beer they're going to have to do it exactly like the Germans did it <laughs> so anyway just Kitasato went back to J to Japan and he established an infectious disease institute in his uh, in in the school where he'd come from which was on the southernmost island in in Japan which is called Kyushu in the and the university was Kumamoto and um he went on from there and and ultimately sort of set up a similar kind of a uh, an operation in Japan that Bering had done, or, or that Robert Koch had done in Berlin, and that Louis Pasteur had done in Paris, and then in 1901 as well is when they started the Rockefeller Institute in in, uh, in the United States, and it was all focused down on microbiology and bacteriology. So, um, so I recommend you continue to investigate both Kitasato and Bering. They both, in 1901, also Bering was made a, a, a baron. He was given a, a, a title of the nobility, so he's von Ber Bering, right? Now. Everybody responds, or you know, now he's von Bering, and he wanted that because that was in the Germanic situation. There, as I put him a little step above everybody else. And then the same thing happened with Kitasato, and I think it was in much much later, like a decade or more later, they made him a baron too in in Japanese aristocracy. <laughs> so. It was, so it's fun. And so I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks for listening. So if you've enjoyed this video, um, please like, subscribe, and sign up for my newsletter, uh, where I'm serializing my new book, which is called The, the Quest for New Knowledge. You'll find a sign-up link below. Hey, thanks again. It's been great.